good morning everyone and welcome and the first thing that i want to start with is uh, you know i don't come here as a science teacher so so please accept my standpoint that you know much more than i do vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in classrooms what your daily struggles are uh, what your strengths are and all that i'm trying to do is facilitate a conversation for yourself you know when you do what you do on a day to day basis in your classes uh, can you have a vantage point of creating a dialogue around it with your peers with yourself so so in in that humility and it's not contrived uh, i genuinely feel that i have very little to offer you by way of telling you what to do right or wrong in your classes so that's the first thing i wanted to start off with very interestingly my powerpoint the head part has been uh, slashed no wonder right uh, that's something which uh, inevitably also what happens when you have to cope with the expectations of the school system the expectation of uh, an assessment body like the cbsc which wants you to you know cover a certain span of course look at curriculum in very specific ways think of getting things done in class over a period of time so your assessment regimes your curriculum regimes your textbook regimes the expectations from parents of what you are preparing the children for so even as you step uh, i shouldn't be saying that but as a parent uh, i feel that when i hear my daughter's teachers talking about what she's doing right in the science classroom or not doing right often times it comes from the frame that you know this person might be going to a medicine institute she might be going to an engineering institute or she may not be able to go there right so i've struggled i'm struggling as a parent uh, i didn't struggle so much as a student of physics myself i studied physics uh, till my masters and i realized it's i'm not maybe cut out for it but yet with all those weaknesses uh, i'm trying to facilitate a conversation here my core points of uh, where i want to go with this over the next one and a half two hours in which you would be uh, participating a lot and filling in the gaps for me is basically these five points and what are my arguments we are often trapped in the binary of activity based and content based teaching research in the domain of science education indicates that focusing on inquiry and reflecting on the nature of science can open a range of possibilities for science teachers with a new pedagogical lens we'll come back to both the nature of science and what has inquiry got to do with it i'll be sharing the powerpoint with sanyukta she can email it to all of you so there's nothing in it okay pedagogical exploration is critically important for professional development of science teachers that's a firm belief that i have for all teachers how to begin rethinking science teaching to foster curiosity a sense of inquiry and courage to raise questions both among your students and yourselves do we have the courage or what conditions do we need to create to strengthen that courage and lastly there's much to be learned in trying to unlearn how we were taught science in schools and universities and and i can see that uh, with all humility i'm saying this that some of you may have over like what what's what's your teaching experience like how long have you been teaching science um, 28 years 28 years yeah what about you 25 years ma'am two months so i have 28 years 25 years two months just on this side of the row i'm sure it is a similar narrative on this side and and then i think that you've taught for 28 years um, what am i doing here you should be here <laughs> no so you've taught for 28 years and uh, and i'm sure most of you are from banyan school and some from different schools and you may have taught not in the same school right you've taught in how many schools my husband was in services so we shifted and i had the opportunity to teach in hyderabad in both okay so you've been a student for 12 years then a student of science probably for the next 5 years or so as a teacher training you did another course and then you've been in school system now with that range of experience i'll go to the next slide and ask you to just contemplate 
few images. Uh, how many of you teach PGT? Just by a show of hands at PGT level. Okay. How many of you teach primary or have taught primary science? How many of you teach middle level school? Yeah, most of you. Middle science. Uh, what is this? This is a solar system. Are you happy with the way this solar system has been drawn? It's a grade four student who's drawn a representation of the solar system. Okay, so now that you've said child is developing the concept, what are the concepts do you think uh, when we introduce solar system or you start conversation about universe, what are the concepts that uh, we want the students to get? Isn't this like your class? Like, there are people speaking simultaneously from different parts of the group. So this is like your classes. But I'll stay with what you are saying. You're saying that you want them to engage with what is, right? And when do you introduce uh, this these kinds of concepts in school? When is? Right. What do you think a child needs to know about the universe? What do they need to appreciate, apart from the fact that what is? That you are part of a universe, you're part of a galaxy. Within the galaxy, you're part of a solar system. And within the solar system, you are on Earth, which is one of the planets. More than that, anything else? Do you think it's a good idea to introduce them to the idea of solar system when they're that young, when they draw the sun here, the various sizes and proportions? Does it bother you? She's saying that uh, what students are bothered by is the fact that you're showing us, you're telling us that Earth is a sphere, but we seem to be standing on a flat surface. For as far as I can see, it is that. And how do you convince them that they are on the, on the sphere? Have you, how many of you have had to convince primary school children that Earth is a sphere? Or they accept it at face value? Sorry, this side? For the little ones, they more or less accept it. They're accepted? But no, but they do ask uh, other questions, like if you go on, go on, go on, then what happens? And if okay. you fall, you're going to fall. That's Within this row? They will differentiate between sphere and circle, circle or object. So, the the so you're struggling with shapes also, shape. but then from very concrete, near to you shapes, uh, we are asking them to abstract and, and create an imagery of things which they've not seen. And of course, they've seen it on their tabs. They've seen it on various uh, Google sites. They know, they've seen Google Map, right? Uh, have you struggled, like genuinely struggled in your classrooms? Hold on to that. Cool, but... Now, you're talking about your students' experience. For a moment, to start with, uh, if you humor me, start with, uh, are all of you on one bench from the same school? Yeah. This is Banyan School? All. Okay. okay, that's fine. So spend a little time and try to think of the most profound learning experience. Just stay with the first bullet. The most profound learning experience you have had Try to identify one or two events from which you learned the most. Can you take five minutes, talk amongst yourself, and note it down on a piece of paper? One on the table to record it for all of you. Just take five minutes, talk amongst yourself. 
And I'm not saying whatever, even though it's all written here. Take five minutes and do this. You got about five to seven minutes. Uh, you got five to seven minutes to talk about your own experience and reflect, take a moment out of whatever you had planned to come here and do. And in these seven moments, if it's being recorded there, I think the noise level in the room went fantastically up, right? I couldn't, you couldn't hear me, I couldn't hear myself when I said, please come back to me, right? So you're also thinking about where I'm going with this is a classroom space uh, where dialogue and discussion is required, where you imagine that whatever learning happens meaningfully will require noise to be acceptable. Okay, so I don't know how acceptable or how meaningful this discussion was for you. We'll come back to that. So it's about, take these pointers in terms of that noise is good, discussion is helpful, Voice is very, very important. Self and classroom. There are these 40 cells uh, of you coming here on a weekend, taking time out, trusting that I have something of value to offer. Similarly, there are these 40 lives or 45 lives who are there. And they're not just lives. They're not just recipients. They are not just empty jugs. They are their very little cells or mature cells in your classrooms. So there is yourself as a teacher in classroom, and then there are your students. So that was just an aside. Now, but when you thought about, uh, when I went up to your tables and I asked you, many of you uh, asked back, what kind of learning are you talking about? You know, very subjective. It could be anything. It could be in my marriage. It could be with my domestic help. It could be with my boss. It could be anything. And then I said that, you know, you look at the last question, uh, or the second question, having thought when you start thinking about what was the most critical aspect of your learning, then suddenly uh, it seems that it's not so much obvious that as a teacher that the most learning upon, uh, moment would have necessarily happened in a classroom, and most definitely not in your science classroom. Is the, am I right, or am I off the track? How many of you had like a, an aha moment in your science class in school or in university, or in your own classes? At least one. Of course, it is, this is about you going back, past life regression, your student life regression. Yeah. What's your name, please? Vandana. Thank you, Vanna. Anything close to that or better than that, if not a full aha moment, a semi-aha moment, something which you can actually claim that, you know, after having 12, 28 years or even two months, uh, that's what brought you here. You know, something happened in that space that brought you here and is making you do going on, uh, doing what you're doing in your classrooms. In your conversations, did uh, anything close to that came? Anything? Okay, leave science classrooms. Anything close to the school space came in your discussion? Your learning in school? It didn't figure? Pakka? Okay. How old were you when you had your uh, learning experience? So if it was outside classroom, nothing that school did mattered, right? Nothing? No, something mattered. Beyond what is given in the text. That was not something. It was like, you know, 
You, yeah. So, so you are teachers, yeah. <laughs> okay. I already love this teacher. So, yeah. You remember his name? Mr. Joshi. Okay. So it's been 28 years. She has been teaching, and so many years back, he taught her. She remembers his name. She remembers a very specific episode of thinking about living, non-living, yeah. and, and, and that episode of what and happened. Yeah. And then another thing I can never forget is that that time I was doing my PhD with Michael Dunn. And my guide, and it was uh, at that age in college. My uh, friends were in some other department and I was stuck with the autoclave and you know, ceremonial things and uh, going to Kunai and they were playing movies. So I said, mm -hmm. let me not eat, you know, autoclave is too late. So I just waited less time. So obviously the other had other growth than the Kunai. So when my wife came back, so she caught hold of me and she said, uh, Sangeeta, what have you done? So I said, I partially sterilized it. So she says, you come here. Can you be partially pregnant? She said yes or no. Same way you cannot have it partially determined. So in a way she's saying that the intervention and constructive role a teacher's uh, presence can make yeah. in how student starts thinking or engaging. What I wrote there as EXP and EXP, by the way, is what Vandana say, shared was the, an experience in the science classroom, right? Where she saw that you could, you know, the way you engage with the world, the way you understand what's happening around you, what sense do you make out of a bee sting? You don't need a science teacher to tell you what to do. I think your grandmothers would also do that. So it's not necessarily what he got taught in a science classroom, but also what knowledge we retain in terms of uh, you know, life around us. But since you said that hands-on is more now, and we were taught in a transmittive mode, that's what you're saying, right? Most of us were taught science how? That assumption that you can be taught science, you can be taught scientific facts. When you're being taught science, you're being taught scientific facts, you're being taught uh, what to see around you, what to accept, and, and you feel uncomfortable with that, right? You feel uncomfortable because that does not uh, allow for you to be an active participant in making sense of the world around you, right? And what's the justification for textbooks to give you scientific knowledge as received knowledge? You know, as a body of fact which needs to be memorized. Now imagine, hypothetically speaking, a textbook before 1957 or 1956, a textbook before 1944, a textbook before 1905, 1906. How many of you have studied physics? Quite a few. Broadly speaking, what was the world of science textbooks like before Einstein's special theory of relativity? That paper, famous paper, came. What was, what was science textbooks writing when the whole revolution in quantum mechanics was going on? What were school science textbooks telling children about our reality? How many of you have tried teaching the concept of oxygen uh, what is oxygen? One, a clear sound voice to me. What is oxygen? Oxygen is an element. Who discovered it? Zor say. Priestley discovered, Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen. Are you sure? Can you draw oxygen for me, one of you volunteers? Can you draw oxygen for me? Oxygen, if you have to show what oxygen is, what would you, if I was to give that absurd thing to you, that oxygen is an element, right? It's an element of the nature. It was discovered by someone. Somebody identified this element. Somebody separated this element. 
right, from the compounds that exist, right? Uh, you said Priestley. Where did the term oxygen came from? Who gave the term oxygen? Priestley didn't coin it as oxygen. He was discovering something else. It's a famous French man, uh, French man. Of course, I don't challenge you, but what I'm asking you is that when did, we're talking about textbooks, when did things start coming into textbooks? So for things to start come in, uh, to become part of your textbook, they have to be identified and accepted by the scientific society, right? Uh, do you know the year of French Revolution, by the way? There's a political scientist in this room. She better tell me uh, the year of the French Revolution. Okay, give me the century. 18th century. In France, when French Revolution was going on, there was a very famous chemist, a philosopher, who was setting up huge experiments. And this man who was you know, part of the hoi polloi, he used to be a tax collector, a king's man, you know, on the wrong side of the revolution, but a scientist nonetheless. He was being assisted by his very brilliant wife in setting up these elaborate, contrived experiments. Bohat kuch ho tha. And to be, like, sad about it, usne bohat exploit kiya logo ko. Itna exploit kiya ki kuch saalo mein, uh, jab teen saal ho chuke the revolution ko, Jacobins got hold of him and guillotined him. In a public proceeding, his head was taken off his body. Not because he did something fantastic in science, but he was part of the feudal kingdom hierarchy. That man gave the name oxygen. Any guess? A very French sounding name. All science teachers, uh, you know, those NCRT books have those small boxes. We'll come to why they are there, but tell me. If I say Lavoisier, do you, anything rings a bell? Lavoisier? It rings a bell to you? You've heard Antoine Lavoisier? Huh? Lavoisier? He coined the term oxygen. You're talking about oxidation. You know, this poor man, oxygen, the Latin roots uh, actually signify a term which is known as acid maker. This man's life was troubled. He was, his dreams had been like, stolen away from him because he wanted to discover that element or that substance which is responsible for making acids. And therefore, in his head, in his experimental setups, he was working with certain ideas and facts which, uh, you know, he, therefore he said that one critical element which is responsible for making acids should be oxygen. That element should be oxygen. The chemistry teachers, please tell me, is oxygen responsible for making acids? HCl, hydrochloric acid, it does not have oxygen in it. A term which signifies acid maker, you know, that element which is responsible for making acids, an element gets named after it, but lo and behold, parallel to him, there is Priestley working. There is also another guy, if you know his name, Joseph Stahl, right? He's working on a parallel theory to understand what causes rusting, what causes burning, what causes combustion, what causes oxidation, and they have a completely different theory. They believe there is actually an element called as phlogiston. Have you heard of this name? So most of you are postgraduates in sciences. When I did my postgraduation in physics, uh, I didn't need to know any of this, but I just, this was not part of my textbooks. But if you pick up any 18th century uh, work of science or a university manual, you had two competing theories. You had multiple competing theories, but the main theory was the phlogiston theory to which Joseph Priestley subscribed. They felt that each element, there was no element like oxygen in the first place, but each element contains with it, in, within it a quality, a phlogiston. So if you burn wood, 
it turns into an ash because in the process of burning with fire operating on that element, what that object is emitting is phlogiston. Priestley tried to do those experiments, famous experiments, right? What happens when you put a jar over a candle? Kya hota hai? Priestley ne kaha ki na, jab wo jar dalte hain us candle ke upar, to jo sara phlogiston uh, us jar ke andar ya surrounding mein tha, wo uh, absorb ho jata hai, aur wo candle ke wick ke around jam jata hai, and then all the other phlogiston that is inside cannot come out. So you keep burning, you keep supplying external energy, but it's not going to come out. This guy, Lavoisier, he got one thing right, oxygen, the name. And I'm not even sure if that was right, but he said that if I have to put in my conceptual scheme to explain combustion and uh, this process of oxidation, I need, to need, I need two concepts. If I'm saying oxygen is the acid maker and it's part of the nature and it's present when oxidation is happening and combustion is happening, I need another idea of the calorie, the caloric. So in his table, that periodic table of elements, he placed oxygen and he placed caloric. The experiments that Priestley was doing and the explanation that he was propagating or promoting within the phlogiston theory actually paved the way over 30, 40 years for them to identify that what is, actu what is oxygen actually? How is it playing a role in the oxidation process and in the combustion process? <coughs> As science teachers now, we don't need to know any of this, do we? You apparently don't know about this uh, you know, silly story. Ek to levosia mar gaya, science ke liye bhi nahi. At least Galileo we remember fondly because he was a martyr of science. Do you remember him? Do you remember Galileo as a martyr of science? How many of you like to consider him as a martyr of science? Martyr is somebody who loses their life for a great cause. Koi nation ke cause ke liye jata hai, koi you know family honor ke liye jata hai. Wo kiske honor ke liye gaye the? Knowledge ke honor ke liye gaye the. So none of this seems to be relevant. And I seem to be losing you right now. But why am I asking you these things? We are presenting scientific facts and information in textbooks like they are precinct. They're not messy. <coughs> Reality is waiting out there for us to go and put a cap on it, put a label on it. You only needed some very bright minds to just go out there and figure out what oxygen is. Too bad. What it's named after, it's not responsible for it. In the honor of the Lavoisier and what his uh, you know, life was about, and I'm so glad we've forgotten him because we've not, we would not have remembered his wife either. We would not have remembered his wife. No history of science book talks about Lavoisier's wife as somebody who could do the experiments, and not just do the experiments, by the way, set up experiments. There's a reason why I've put this woman with long hair and open, messy hair in the science lab. I was thinking about Lavoisier's wife. I was thinking about how that rich man's daughter would take pains to imagine, even make a Bunsen burner, to make that perfect flask in which you could heat up elements and make those very contrived tubes, jahan se jo gas nikal rahi hai, collect karke, distill kar sake. All of that was being done by a woman. All of you, incidentally, are women. The only man who was attending the session left the room. So, so much for my bullshit, okay? <clears throat> but this beautiful woman, somebody like her, is not part of the narrative of what we do in classes. That, that frail woman who's like, oh, my hand jalna nahi chahiye. So, wo, usne, wo itne elaborate uh, uh, experiments set up kiye the. When she didn't know what they were trying to discover, a hunch, a hypothesis tha, that two things seem to be happening contiguously, simultaneously. So operating on that hypothesis, it was possible to throw an arrow in the dark. That was science for them. A science at a time when you did not have any conceptual grit taken for granted. A science where you did not even have the term science. 
you know, you were talking, when you talked about science, you were talking about any kind of method. You were talking about Rene Descartes method of doubt. You were talking about uh, things that you do in your head. You were thinking about thanks to the tradition which Galileo forwarded, thought experiments you were thinking about, actually the need to set up experiments and show something. So at that time, it was also possible to think of inquiry in a very open-ended, indulgent way. All these great names that are part of the small boxes in our uh, science textbooks, whether it's Robert Hooke, Robert Boyle, Faraday, very, very interesting personalities. Mr. Joshi saying that, you know, basically, what's the difference between the stone and the guy? What's the concept that you could have built upon, you know, or what he was thinking in terms of the elemental nature of uh, both the non-living and the living? There's something which you're working with. There was something which these people in 18th century, where they didn't know kaha ja hai, they were also working with. They were struggling very hard to create a conceptual grid that made sense. They were working very hard to create a conceptual grid which could be interlinked, which could be, uh, you know, which could help you in making certain other progresses, which could help you to predict, not just explain, which could help you to have a breakthrough in creating something else. For this reason, uh, sciences evolved. For this reason, the disciplines evolved. For this reason, you moved away from alchemy to chemistry, for instance. Right? Is any of that possible in the limited space of a classroom? Can you take them back to their journey? Science is, the textbook is giving you a given fact that oxygen is an element. I draw to you that in by mid 19th century, you agreed that oxygen was what it was, but you still needed the atomic theory of matter to understand why is oxygen the way it is? Do you know the orbital picture of uh, oxygen? Anyone amongst you? If you were to draw, draw, we teach valency, by the way, in which standard? Valency you teach valency in ninth, right? Secondary school science. Are, are students ready for that? So we are teaching them what? You're teaching them physics, you're teaching them chemistry, and you're teaching them biology. Broadly, in the science subject, you'd classify it like that, right? And you expect them to understand that what we breathe in is oxygen, which is essential for respiration. That's part of biology. Oxygen has certain chemical properties, physical properties, right? It has certain chemical properties. You teach them how matter reacts. That you take up in chemistry. But what is matter? You take up in physics. What is matter? What is the structure of oxygen that allows for all those chemical reactions to take place? And you teach them in three different classes. So when you say that they are not ready for valency in class nine, what do you do? You tell them oxygen looks like something, right? I really want somebody to draw it. Please, no shame. What is the valency of oxygen? Two. Two. Which means what? Please, please. Yeah, yeah. Draw in your class nine class. When you want to show them. Uh, like if, if this session is taken, we take a picture of this session and put in the brochure, it will look and represent something. Like a nucleus and around the nucleus we have electrons. In class five we are showing them. Thank you. What's your name? Thank you, Vipha. Big volunteer, okay. Is this, this is the chemistry class, right? Yes. Ninth okay. class. Ninth class. They have this, okay, go back to this. Have you ever used? Yes, yes. 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 So in class nine, you tell them that the orbital model, or this thinking about the atom, you can think about the solar system. Is that right? With this, we are telling them that it is not because they are charged and they 
are not charged. But those working with gravitational energy, mm -hmm. here the electrons are exposed to certain power. Okay. I'll come back here. Can you share one question regarding oxygen which came across in public transit? Okay. But what time do you begin? Like there are PGT teachers also here. That when you class eleventh. So is progression in science classes from primary to higher secondary is about teaching them wrong stuff, teaching them inaccurate representation, and then increasingly muddling their heads and then telling them in class eleven. Acha, abhi tumhe fir second approximation bata dete. Actually, what these are are they fixed spaces? on which these subatomic particles are moving. What is electron made of? What is the first aapko bola ki the most, the smallest, reducible, uh, kya bolte hai? particle undivisible. is the, undivisible, undivisible particle is the, is the atom. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. I wish I had you as my teacher, Rupa. No, seriously, most teachers forget to tell this, that the most, uh, the smallest undivisible particle which will also have the properties of the element is the atom, right? This atom is mysterious. This atom is outside the realm of what that lady seems to be doing there. You can set up experiments and say that science is about intercepting reality as it exists out there, making sense of it, by just seeing. All you have is to see carefully, observe carefully. Hum bolte hai na? Observation mein sabse zaruri hai dhyan se dekhna. Dhyan ke liye kya chahiye? What is the prerequisite for observation? Often goes amiss and there is, I don't think there is space also in, in, your, in your classrooms competing in whatever else is going on in the school between multiple other subjects. We've already divided the reality into these three categories. We teach them this. What is this? I'm saying it's an inaccurate representation, but it's a, just philosophy mein bolenge, heuristic model hai. It's a heuristic model, enabling them to capture a concept in some sense, create an imagery, not the perfect model, but uh, something which will help them keep the schema in mind. Exactly like we introduce the solar system in class four. We again don't go back in history and tell them that, of course we tell them Copernicus. We tell them Copernicus that he helped us to move this thing from here to here. We tell them that 600 years ago, absolutely. Yeah. So all that I'm trying to highlight for you here is that many practices that we do or take for granted, <coughs> um, things that we have to do as chores, you know, they have a history behind it. They have a context in which, uh, you know, these concept grids evolved. It will take you a lot of time if you yourself are not part of that inquiry. It will take you a lot of time in resolving what your expectations are from students. You may be the best teacher. You may have extremely good command over your subject. And by that also, people, different people will have different you know, conceptions of it. What, is, what do you mean by good command over a subject? Is that sufficient to do, be a good teacher of science? Good command? At the level of students to whom you are teaching. Absolutely. But what is good command over subject also? Hmm. And also explore, you know, because there are changes which are happening in science. So if I'm telling them something, you know, it's not been updated in the book, but rather it has got updated. So that's not a very basic thing to get these exercises. Yeah. How many of you, yeah. Updated because, you know, it is happening around. 
Can you, can you, yeah. Can you hear her? What's her name, sorry? Preeti is saying that chromato, yeah. Just say it aloud for them. So you think you'll be able to do a good job if you tell them more? <clears throat> no, we can, let's stay with that. Sure, sure. Absolutely. So there is no denying the fact that having a good command over your subject, being engaged with your subject is extremely important. What Preeti is pointing towards is that your education might have finished when you done, completed your master's or even wrote your thesis. Your discipline is continuing to grow, right? And how do you read or how do you keep on with your discipline? You know, Einstein, when he was writing, I'll tell you the story of another woman, if you allow me. Einstein, when he was writing his paper on relativity and those three papers when they came together in 1905, uh, he had a young wife. He was a young parent. His wife was his classmate in university. They had a child before marriage whom they abandoned, <clears throat> gave up for adoption because they were too young to take care of a child. <clears throat> the second time around, they had been married. She was a brilliant physicist. Many argue that uh, those publications which came out in 1905 were joint publications between Einstein's wife and him. I'm not even able to recall the name of the lady. I know the name, but suddenly it's just vanished from my brain. It's become foggy. I, I can't recall her name. A very important person contributed to development of ideas which challenged our understanding of space-time configuration. It shook the world. It brought Newton, just about the comparative frame. It not, did not cut Newton to size, but it changed how we saw Newton, how we made sense of world around us. Take care. So that. Those developments, uh, why did I mention her name? I mentioned her name because in her autobiography, in her daughter's reflection or you know, recollection of the memory about her mother, she said, increasingly, even after contributing to those seminal papers, as a mother, she found it extremely hard to follow up with what, Einstein's, what Einstein was developing. As a house, there were a community of scholars who would come and discuss those ideas. And she said that she found it increasingly hard to keep up to mark. She could explain, she could qualify, she could describe, but it was, she found it extremely hard to keep up to her subject. How many of you feel uh, that you can pick up a journal in your discipline and read it comfortably today, as of today? Some of you I know have just graduated. So two people, which journals do you access? Okay, fantastic. What about others? How do you access these journals in school system? Library has, ex has your libraries have ascribed to scientific journals. How many school libraries in this? As I know Banyan to Pichapura hai, but you don't have schools subscribing to scientific journals. Would you want to read a scientific? I have found it difficult. The only reason I'm sharing this with you is. Having uh, left physics at some point in my life, actively, I find it increasingly difficult to pick up a contemporary journal, even resonance, and make sense of the new developments. If somebody asks me to explain the Copenhagen interpretation and quantum mechanics, uh, I can describe it, but I don't know if I really understand. And I'm coming here in school, and, I'm suppo and I feel at one level that I'm trying to simplify it, because their lives are not going to change. You know, they are going to be perfectly functionally all right if they understand what electrons are. When I tell them that, uh, you know, the concept of light in primary school, two concepts are taken very contiguously together. One is light and the other is light. When in primary school, we introduce light, what object is it? 
Reflection and not even reflection. And it's, you want to explain? Non-luminous, another concept. You want them to understand? You want to I want them to understand how what are, what are shadows? Like principal reason for introducing light in primary classroom is how do you tell them what a shadow is? A volunteer who hasn't spoken. Yeah. Light is blocked by an opaque object. And what do you want them to get out of it? So what is light? Is that a concept that troubles you in explaining? I, we began with a concept that troubled you, but how many of you have tried to teach light to? The solar system was one. Kisine or light nahi padhaya? At any level? No? <coughs> in EVS also, in environmental science, yeah. How many of you have uh, learned disciplines like chemistry and biology but have to teach physics also at secondary level or middle school level? None of you? You're saved? Okay. You might want to try some of these things in the sense that I found that those who study physics find it extremely hard to explain in clear terms, in open terms, what all can be taught when you're teaching shadows. What properties of light do you want the student to get home with and think about? And then <coughs> light travels in straight line. And then it travels in, sorry? Pinhole cameras. So what ma'am is saying and what ma'am is saying here is that what you said, that when we were taught science, hame bata diya gaya, light travels in straight line, an object, it, pictorial diagram banake, just, just the way the pictorial diagram there, that this is how you do it. And that has been an advancement. Some of this advancement has come out of this. If you just focus here, in 1960s when teachers were doing science classrooms, and I'm sure there were some fantastic teachers in science classrooms then, but very few teachers had formally received any training in the use of scientific processes. They did not know what was meant by a variable could not design experiment, evaluate evidence, or draw valid conclusions. <clears throat> they did not know how to ask or recognize appropriate questions for children. Post-1960s, across the world, uh, but also in Indian contexts, there have been major experiments and reform initiatives, some grounded uh, in field realities some grounded in context of social movements. I don't know if you've heard about Hoshangabad science teaching program. How many of uh, you have heard about the National Curriculum Framework 2005? Most of you, right? So the position paper on science teaching, uh, which is uploaded on the NCRT website, it uses certain terms like inquiry, nature of science, very, very specifically, and it foregrounds the fact that if you are going to make a difference in terms of creating citizens uh, who can draw upon the method of science, who can draw upon uh, their scientific training to be better citizens, to be more rational, you know, all those claims. They're coming out of a framework and of educational reforms which were led by some of these movements. Can you teach science differently from what you started sharing, that all of us were taught science as a body of facts? What I started with saying that the textbooks do represent to you uh, the consensual knowledge. Knowledge as is known right now. Knowledge as information, knowledge as received view. What these experiments tried to do, uh, they wanted to make science interesting in the lives of rural India, in the lives of children in rural India. They wanted to see that if all these claims about science seem to be true, that if you are scientific in your orientation, in your outlook, if by studying science, uh, if by studying science, uh, you could actually change the way you look at the world, you would become more skeptical, you would become more organized in your thinking, you would follow certain logical processes, then 
teaching of science as facts, how is it enabling you to make that jump? If I tell you to accept that oxygen is what it is, and I don't take you through what processes scientists have followed, if I don't know myself as a teacher, if I'm competent enough to tell you that this is the correct knowledge at this time, this is the right knowledge, am I facilitating scientific thinking for you? What I'm definitely facilitating is appreciation in you of authority figure, of you as somebody who has command over your knowledge or command over your discipline as communicating as a good transmitter. And many would argue that in today's time with Alexa and Google and their huge repositories of knowledge, can't you be replaced if you're doing that? Can't you be replaced if you were not there, right? If students are there and Alexa is there, and I ask Alexa about Levosia, I'm sure like Alexa in like uh, one second will be able to access things written on Levosia which, you know, his historian may not know, that things being written even currently and up on blog, was all resource like so of course you think about in terms of how you might be replaced by artificial intelligence, but what are, it, what are you trying to do and how competent do you feel in, in terms of you know, drawing upon what others have done? If I can spend, would you want me to talk for one minute about Hoshangabad science teaching program? Hoshangabad is a place in Madhya Pradesh. Okay. And a bunch of scientists from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in 1960s, uh, they were concerned about development and uneven development in India, okay? In terms of how metropolitan cities or the center was usurping, appropriating all knowledge systems. It was appropriating the best that the state had to offer. And they wanted to think that, you know, there are problems which are going on in our villages. There is a land reform movement which is pending. Right? There is unrest among people because state has not been able to deliver justice or the promises at the time of independence. And how do you ensure that people can uh, you know, challenge entrenched hierarchies and rigidities? What do you want to challenge the system? First, you need a consciousness that things are not right with us. You need a consciousness that is critical, that says that हम गरीब हैं तो हम अपनी वजह से गरीब नहीं हैं। We are landless because our lands have been usurped. These kind of broad political uh, questions drove a bunch of scientists uh, from across the country to come together and say that if scientific temper is about uh, understanding how to critically question your reality out there, how to take up inquiry in a manner that it changes your consciousness, how you see the world, how you start seeing patterns and relations. If you're doing something in a science classroom, if you're engaging in inquiry in a science classroom, which means you're going through all the processes which are part of scientific inquiry, which is setting up a hypothesis, setting up an experiment to test the hypothesis, whether a thought experiment or a hands-on experiment, looking at the results, going back to what theoretical premises you started with, checking what the result is telling to you, Going back to hypothesis and saying that this is, what is the explanation for it? If all these processes are being done serious, seriously in classrooms, there is no way the children getting out of these spaces can continue to be uncritical in the world outside. They would be critical, they should be critical in all domains of life because thinking, inquiry, curiosity cannot be watertight. If you think creativity and curiosity are only in arts, it's a big fallacy, right? Leonardo da Vinci, the most famous artist, was also, is also known and celebrated as an inventor. Somebody who could go beyond what was given at a given point in time, right? They used this as a model and said that science ko karane ke liye ke lab chahiye schools ke andar. Gao mein hum bolte hain ki ek, uh, ek 1986 mein operation blackboard aaya tha that most schools do not even have a blackboard. Ye nahi hai. So kam se make blackboard de dije. 1960s mein wo keh rahe the, you may not have material in a classroom, but you can improvise material, you can create material, you can set up experiments in class, just like Lavoisier's wife, uh, you know, contrived, usne manipulate karke cheeze experiments ko set up kiye. You can start rethinking your discipline on first principle basis. Ho sakta hai, kuch bohat hi galat kar de. But inquiry is about that. Inquiry is about making errors, 
asking questions which may not have been asked, or bringing the original questions back to class. Questions like these, starting from the stone and Ganesh. Can you do that? They started doing that, and they found that it's not so simple. It's very easy to walk in like I have done, put a PowerPoint in there, and start talking, assuming you will understand me and not question me, and I know what you will get out of it. Very difficult when you're going to a field in which you're not being paid for. All these people worked on a very voluntary basis, and they created a body of material. If you want to read it, it's published in the book published hai, uh, written by Sushil Joshi. Eklavya brought it out. How they set up experiments and activities which are now part of your syllabuses. The whole movement was tried out in 1960s and early 70s in Hoshangabad. How do you set up experiments in class? And then what do you do with those experiments? Many times I find that activities are being done for the sake of it. You know, at least in primary school and middle school. Uh, government schools, I don't know if it's true in your context, you tell me. When you do activities, amongst the busy things, amongst the fixed schedules like this, ki aise hi betna hai, aise hi class organize hoga, how often do you find that you know, you've been able to do a, an activity very meaningfully, such that it enabled you to do all these things? So have things moved on for you? Have things moved on for you? You feel you're able to do justice to activities? Think for yourself, and, and this doesn't apply to you then, definitely, right? The last part. Very nice. I found uh, in my, one of my daughter's classes, I'll go back to this picture. You see that volcano there? They're teaching chemical reactions, and, and they tell them about kitchen science. Have you heard it? Hoshangabad had made a phrase very famous, Kabar se jugar. Right? There is Arvind the... Uh, Arvind Gupte? No. Tell me. How many of you buy books for your schools in Pragati Medan at book fair? Yeah. Have you gone to the Eklavya stroll? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know why I'm skipping the name, but Arvind Gupta, he has a website and... Uh, and on his website, you'll find a lot of such resources of Kabar Se Jugar. One, and the science kit, the famous science kit, which all schools buy to do things in class. One part of that movement is the kitchen science movement, that you can take material from your kitchen, just like that, the soda that you said, that you can treat. But what do you achieve out of performing that activity? One dissatisfaction that I've heard from teachers uh, across contexts is the fact that, you know, kara dete hai, but how do you get the maximum out? What are you trying to do conceptually when you do those activities? Ha have you tried something and you felt that, like I felt, what is the kitchen volcano, if you know? That you take some, how do you create a volcano, volcano-like effect? Yeah, you take baking soda and vinegar. and vinegar, and then what happens? So is it a magic trick, or what are we teach, trying to teach students when we perform that, or get them to do that? Is it an exciting moment in class? Yeah, for them it's an exciting moment, but what do you achieve by doing some of these different activities? Do you plan when you're doing these activities? Often, yeah? Child will be seeing that CO2 is releasing? Okay, so a child will, yeah. So some concepts you're not aiming at, you're aiming at something else.
So we are trying to tell them how the volcano erupts, but the reaction is short-lived. It neither tells us much about volcanoes, not the chemical reaction taking place. You may tell them, but what do you tell them? Apart from, you could have given them as part of a demonstration. You could have given that as part of your lecture, you know, put the town on the board, and it would matter. If it's in class four, then you don't want them to get troubled by what is CO2, kya ho hai. But what you could have done, I'm just thinking of an alternative. That when I say that, how would you bring or make inquiry as part of your approach to teaching science? Yeah, actually, ma'am, what the yeah. patient hires after work after the subject, they're reading all the facts in the book and all that, so they're just getting them. But, oh, this is also a part of the thing, a science, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So actually, lot if you see the action words we are using here, a lot of it is about telling. Tell, 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 tell. Okay. There are people who are also telling us that we are a superior civilization because we have been using turmeric forever. And now American big multinational medical corporate houses are trying to patent our turmeric. I can tell this to somebody, right? But what is it that I want them to think for themselves? They'll understand the politics of all of this eventually, right? But I don't want to be in my class teacher a propagandist, you know, for anything. I don't want to be a propagandist for scientific knowledge also. Leave alone uh, political knowledge, but I don't want to be a propagandist of scientific knowledge. I don't hold posts from trying to figure out how acids are made to figure out what is getting absorbed? Rejecting things, knowing that that's how scientific knowledge got created. Wo koi pristine hand me down nahi tha. Knowing that, you know, iteration, trial and error, a systematic trial and error, a critical process of reviewing and abandoning your own stance, abandoning what you believed in at one point in time. So, therefore, scientific knowledge as fixed, but something which is evolving. Scientific knowledge, not something as discrete. I'll go back to a slide and ask you to take 5-10 minutes to get a respite from my uh, my monotony. Think about these following statements and maybe on your paper, piece of paper, note it for you. To what extent do you agree or disagree with them? I'm no good at science. I enjoy practical science. I never liked chemistry or biology or physics, as the case may be. I know how to carry out a scientific investigation. I get nervous when I think about teaching science. I look forward to teaching practical science. Just take two, three minutes. What were you discussing in such an animated manner? I wanted to come and sit with you guys. What did you guys discuss? In fact, in terms of, have ever these thoughts come to you or what is your own position? If you were to do a performance appraisal of your teaching, of what you go through, uh, what would you share with us? I have something to share. Man. Yeah. I, I'm an English teacher, not a science teacher. What's your name, sorry? Prerna. Prerna. Yeah, so we have a, a step in class 11, hmm. a chapter. The name is Adventure. 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 Yeah. Adventure. Yeah. Adventure. Yeah. 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 look forward to teaching practical science. So most of you look forward to this? Yes. Pakka? Anything else? You don't feel you're not good at science, no? In science. Hmm. So you feel that... So what you're saying is that your departments prepared you very well in a certain content area. Most of you would have scored a first division, maybe a distinction, 70 percenters, all of you are, right? And then you would have cracked your B.A. exam, done some pedagogy courses, come to classrooms and found 
that sometimes students ask you questions which make you, which is challenging, which, which you go back and say that, you know, I memorized it, but now I have to explain it. So Faraday's laws, I may have memorized them, but now if, they want, if I want them to appreciate what's at the core of it, if I want them to get few concepts, I should be able to do that, right? So how do I say that? Uh, many of you in like a couple of minutes back had mentioned that communication is very important, right? You figure that out when you become a teacher. You figure that out when you become a teacher that it's good to have a good sub subject knowledge, but when you are a teacher, what you also need is pedagogical content knowledge. This thing, Lee Shulman called that as pedagogical content knowledge. When you become teachers, your learning doesn't stop. In fact, your learning curve starts as a teacher. What you're figuring out every day, every class that you go, or you plan a session, when you think about a year, when you think about one class as opposed to next year, uh, I'm sure you're also creating a schema in your head in terms of what am I going to do? Where do I want my students and my children to be at the end of the year? What can they confidently say that they learned from this class from me? What do I want to communicate to them about what physics is? So think in terms of like uh, Prerna, right? an English teacher who got taught by 11th graders about so many things she mentioned about determinism. She might, by the way, if you are interested, you can uh, pick up David Budanis's book, E equals to MC square. Fantastic. You can also read up, uh, there are a few peop popular uh, science writers, history of science writers, John Gribbin, Patricia Farah. Their books are on Amazon. Fantastic, affordable, cheap books. And I'm sure, uh, going through the narrative of development of concepts in physics, those things which we junk because they're no more relevant, it's going to help you create a story in your classrooms. You know, they taught her a story in the literature class. A lot of science which they may not comprehend yet, but that's, yeah. I have to tell them that, okay, this is so much science for maybe one period, so we'll discuss about this later. So they were telling me that this girl has read this girl and there is this girl and who must read it. Yeah, and science is also sometimes un, non, you, you can't comprehend it actually. I have my physics teachers who taught me quantum mechanics, they used to tell me that they can't say for sure they've understood what they're teaching us. Seriously speaking, I studied at University of Delhi's. No, but it's not also that simple. You know, you had fights, you've debates over. Uh, what is the theory of knowledge? Of, of what knowledge are you proposing when you say that this view of universe? You know what explains in the end all these things together? How would you essentially tie up all the investigative lines? How would you bring the concept of light, heat? So please help me. What are the other core concepts in physics? So the major inquiries have been in sound, heat. Electricity, magnetism, magnetism. Nuclear yeah. So we wanted to understand motion. Core fields of inquiry that you wanted to understand was you wanted to understand what light is and phenomena related to light. You wanted to understand what heat is, phenomena related to heat. All the branches of inquiry of thermodynamics and other things have evolved out of these core inquiries. You wanted to understand motion. Mechanics came, right? You wanted to understand motions of different media. Motion in air, motion in water, motion in, right? You're thinking about motion then at subatomic particle, which is where quantum mechanics starts coming in. How are particles interacting with each other? So you're, if you were to explain, like Prerna, that's where I got distracted. If you were to explain to a layman, in few terms, what physics is, what biology is, what chemistry is, would you be able to do that? if your life depended on it. You want to explain to a lay person what biology is, physics is, chemistry is. Right now, sir, help me to map out that if I talk about physics, essentially I want my students to engage with these realms of, of natural phenomena. I want them to appreciate what temperature is. Okay. If I want to tell you, let's stay in physics. 
chemistry? So you have to be coherent to a lay person. What is chemistry about? All matter is chemistry. Chemistry is a discipline. Chemistry is about matter, you're saying. So you'll say matter, you'll say elements and? It's about bonding. It's about? Yeah. Please listen to Vibhaji. Vibhaji, right? No. If I have to explain it to layman. Then I explain that the reactions going around, for example, if you are cooking some food, there is change in flavor. There is change in color. This is chemistry. Simple example, separation of these combinations. Yeah. No. Few terms. Some concepts I'm saying. Like when I said physics, physics is about heat, physics is about light, physics is about sound, physics is about motion, physics is also about matter. No, I would like to say physics is the study of natural phenomena. Yeah. Physics is the study of natural phenomena hmm. to find, ex, uh, what do you say, uh, explanation for them. How okay. If light travels, how it travels? If hmm. the shadow is there, then how? If I want to say about chemistry, chemistry is the how of matter reacts together. Interaction of matter. Interaction of matter. Biology. How can chemistry make life possible? Wow. This is what we call reductionism. Another concept that I'm giving you, you buy a book. What did you say? It's actually the right thing. How can chemistry make life possible? How physics and chemistry make life possible? When I said it's right, I'm saying it's the most contested field right now of what you're saying. Uh, does biology make all the other things happen or, or it's the other way around, how physics and chemistry. So you're saying you can't define biology without defining physics and chemistry. Where are the biology teachers? Please defend your discipline. Biology, physics वाले थोड़े ना बहुत अच्छे मतलब discipline के प्रति सच्चे हैं। उन्होंने बोला है heat, light, sound, motion, natural phenomena, right? Biology, life, that's right. What you say, life, living organisms. Yes. You know, in medicine, till about 1990, uh, 1980s, uh, if you were a student in first year MBBS, your mm -hmm. biggest textbook was mm -hmm. physiology. Ka hota tha. Mm -hmm. That biology is your physiology, right? The major shift that has happened over the last three decades is the fact that physiology is there, but you have an equally thick volume on biochemistry, biomedicine. Mm -hmm. right? So what you're saying is that in biology deals with does biology deal with matter? Of course it does, deals with matter, right? Biology is living with... Uh, what you're teaching, of course, what you're telling me is what you're teaching in biology classrooms. You're teaching them taxonomies. You're teaching them classification of... You're also teaching them some theories about and some processes which are happening, again at cellular level, but different kinds of processes, <laughs> physiological processes. Yes, Prerna.
फिर ना वैसे वी कीप फॉरगेटिंग दैन वी आर ऑल एलिमेंट्स तभी बहुत प्राइड ईगो इट यू टू वर टेकन अ बैक वन स्टूडेंट सेट दिस टू यू यू वर टेकन अ बैक वन स्टूडेंट सेट दिस टू यू ओके ओके ग्रेट so students seem to be having a lot going on at least in prerna's classroom students are excited i have lost you i have lost you can i get you back i am only here for another 20 minutes uh, can i have you back for another 15 20 minutes yeah so if you were to explain people what are you doing what do you want them to know physics it's very very specific chemistry you are saying we are going to talk about elements we are going to talk about chemistry is about understanding chemical reactions right you are doing dealing with physical phenomena and you find at some point in time from what you are saying that these lines are not so blurred if i want to explain physical phenomena uh, what are the implications of why you know you of course maine physics ko upar likha hai wo ek reason hai but physics is also kept down that ultimately if you want to understand biology you have to go down to physics you want to go down to if you want to understand biochemistry also if you want to understand what's happening in chromotherapy or uh, what's happening in crystallography you need to understand the structure of the crystal you need to understand what's happening inside that if you want to talk about pet what is pet have you have you had a pet scan done you shouldn't have to get a pet scan done have you heard of ct scan city scan in medicine in biology right what's happening to you you know x rays of course right you know x rays you know what's mri magnetic resonance imaging using physical phenomena and manipulation of physical phenomena to intercept and closely follow monitor biological processes the linkage between the two people essentially say that uh in philosophy of science there used to be this huge debate that can you break down everything in terms of physical properties and so if you want to explain biology eventually you need to come down to the physics of it if you want to understand cell so therefore physics was considered as a fundamental foundational discipline jitna cutting edge research tha or highest funding was given to physics right now it's ex- it's the exact opposite the most cutthroat research or uh, frontier research ho raha hai wo kahan pe ho raha hai genomics mein ho raha hai ever since the genome project and its publication of findings uh, year 2000 the maximum amount of money is being channelized into understand processes these processes whether it's stem cell research or or other variants of how can you actually manipulate and also understand what is going on in your human body what is circulation what is your immunology what is immune system so when you talk about biology nano medicine is also you know emerging also of course commercially also but also very very significantly relevant and you find that when i hear from you there is much more excitement about this sphere than this sphere you know biology is at a point where physics was with einstein's papers there is so much going on that what do you keep in your textbook do you bring biotechnology as a subject in class 11 and 12 and you start teaching that people have been pushing for that we have been saying all that is redundant knowledge why do you keep on teaching classification to children they can take it up as a hobby keep the simple say put the current and contemporary stuff in again it goes back to a position of teaching science about what is agar information dena hai then you give the most contemporary ones na you the moment, the reason you've thrown levozier out you know it was relevant to keep priestley because he described oxygen's characteristics उसी तरह से बायोलॉजी टेक्स बुक जो थिक थिक 11, 12 का टेक्स बुक्स है परज इट ऑफ नॉन एसेंशियल मटेरियल्स सो यू वुड ऑलवेज बी गोइंग थ्रू दैट प्रोसेस ऑफ बैक एंड फोर्थ इफ इट्स अबाउट कंटेंट अलोन यू वुड ऑलवेज बी कैचिंग अप बट योर मेजर स्ट्रगल एंड एंड योर मेजर चैलेंज एंड द मेजर एक्साइटमेंट ऑफ बींग अ साइंस टीचर इज नॉट टू गेट ट्रैप्ड इन दिस नॉट ट्रैप्ड इन दिस इन टर्म्स ऑफ द कॉन्टेंट बट इट्स टू गेट आउट ऑफ दो चैप्टर वन टू थ्री एंड एटीन एंड लुक at what you are teaching in terms of these five categories <coughs> how and what you do 
in terms of getting your students hooked onto these five things, that they become part of their imagination. The science fiction has hooked the younger generation. The science fiction will tell them that it's important to cross dimensions. So the most cutting edge research in physics which is going on, at least in string theory, or the 11 dimensions, it will become readily taken up. You know, they'll watch Big Bang Theory. Most of the kids in your classroom, uh, eighth onwards, I'm sure they're hooked on to Big Bang Theory. So they will pick on, pick on these things. So some content is exciting them into science. But there's something much more meaningful that you have an opportunity to do when you, when you are there with them. That's an appreciation of the coherent schema, a conceptual grid, a conceptual grid where you are able to establish linkages, where light goes to shadow. This arrow kind of a relationship that I teach light and I teach shadow. But how do you translate this curricular goal into a pedagogical content knowledge. You translate it on a day-to-day -day basis when you say that, when, as you gave an example very rightly, that shadow is produced when an opaque object obstructs the path of light. This one sentence is an exemplar of pedagogical content knowledge. That what is it that you want them to remember and get out? What is it that you want them to then take further and explore about light? What were those fundamental questions which were driving Newton crazy? You know, he sat on his optics book for like three decades, two, two and a half decades, before optics finally came out. There must have been some fundamental questions. No harm in going back to those fundamental questions and getting excited about what you are teaching. You know, you know your content very well. But to get and to be able to weave a story, the pedagogical content knowledge is uh, more about a story, you know. She might do science in her literature classroom, but can you tell a story in your science classroom? I'm talking about inquiry, but I feel that both inquiry, you can't limit inquiry only to hands-on. When I, the first claim that I started with, that there is a false divide between activity-based and content-based. What I'm trying to tell you that as teachers, for you to be able to have those questions, for you to be able to stand apart and say that, this is one uh, you know, I want to create an excitement about. You need a tool. You need a tool. If people tell you you need to finesse your pedagogy, you actually need a story and a narrative to fit in the gap. The gap activity-based, hands-on, you bridge your tools. Your training was taken care of when you were in college, subject training. The training that you have to do for yourself is of the pedagogical content knowledge. The stories that you have to fill for your students, right? That's a very big task. And you may not always take it up because it's not required. But where is the passion that comes? Or can you create? Like There have been major research programs in Australia, US, where they try to say that if you want to simulate, if you want to recreate what's happening in real science in your classrooms, then you go back to the processes of science. And then you go back and you create an appreciation amongst teachers about how were debates settled? How did two competing positions, may say, ek position ko validate kyun kiya gaya? What were these small stories? You know, I didn't say it aloud, but when I was giving you those small tidbits about Einstein's wife, about Lavoisier's wife, I have an ulterior agenda. I want to tell all science teachers who are females, except for one uh, in this classroom, your teaching profession has been feminized. So many of you te read science in universities. So many of you become science teachers. But there are still very few who are scientists. Very few women who are scientists. So an ulterior agenda, which is part of my commitment, my mission, is to keep highlighting the fact that you need to create that confidence at psychological level among your women students that stereotypes are not good. They can also be, like history has done injustice to them but they can contribute to making science. How will you do that? You can't just say that, believe in it suddenly. You will have to dig into something to say that, you know, there have been history of women who've contributed to discourses. Marie Curie wasn't just a very, very hardworking woman. She was an extraordinarily brilliant woman. Maria Montessori, have you heard her name? Do you know anything about her except for the fact that these nursery schools and kindergarten schools are run on her? 
first Italian female doctor. There's another woman, if I can drop her name, Laura Bassi. Laura Bassi, B-A-S-S-I, uh, Sorbonne University. Uh, they made a show of her. She defended something like 48 theses, PhD theses, at a single point in time. Uh, at a time when uh, Italian universities did not admit women students to their halls. So you could not formally study as a student, nor could you formally be a teacher. But they felt that the other fancy universities, given Newton, uh, England, and other places, because of them, their sheen and their shine was getting vanished. So they kept public performance, like in Zoom, they kept a special character. So Laura was asked to do a public defense of a thesis. Thousands of people came from all over Europe to hear a woman talk about physics, mathematics, literature, arts. 48 theses. I'm very humbled because it took me a lot of effort to finish one thesis in education. So you would be able to do many things simultaneously if you yourselves are digging into these stories. You can teach science creatively. You can find different kinds of thoughts if you want to. You know? And if your professional development is about documenting the kind of work that you've been doing, the great work that you've been doing, the mundane work that you've been doing, you will also have to step out and think in terms of what counts as professional development for you. You, know, you can come here, uh, listen to some of these talks, and I don't know if I've done justice to your two hours on a weekend, or one and a half hours on the weekend, but you can definitely do justice to what you have been doing in your classes and to your own professional development uh, by picking these up. So my main claim is that inquiry teaching is not just hands-on, it is also minds-on. Science is not just for the most brilliant Science is not just for a differently wired brain. If teaching science has all those goals which the National Curriculum Framework lists right now, in terms of having a scientific attitude, in terms of being open to curiosity, in being able to be creative, then it's for everyone. It's for those who hate science, those who are scared of science. Uh, it's for all of them. So what the reformers are suggesting is that you don't need a new science. You don't need a new teacher in classroom. But what you need is a rather different ways of teaching and seeing the old one. And it's not for the students. It's for us as the community of teachers. That how do you retool yourself? How do you, uh, you know, learn? And I'm amazed that there's a political science teacher and English teacher sitting in this space and uh, engaging. I need to go to the other slide. So what I've tried to uh, do in the last one, one and a half hours is to challenge for you these kind of facts. You know, these are part of a standard survey on which many science teachers and students responded about how they perceived science. They saw, they viewed knowledge in science as connected of many disconnected as comprising of many disconnected topics. When you mapped out that, you know, that is physics for you, that is chemistry for you, and then you said that, but it's all interconnected, uh, many times your students who are graduating and, or, and teachers also, when they're completely into, the, into their disciplines, uh, they feel about it that way. So when a biology teacher is asked to teach physics, hands up. You know, a physics teacher asked to teach some bit of biology, I was part of an interview process where uh, I had a young person who said, I've just finished my MSc and I've been told to teach middle school science and which involves teaching everything and he had done zoology. So he said, but this topic is in botany. I am not comfortable with it. It genuinely happened. No, I'm not critiquing that guy here, but you know, imagine the plight of our university system of how we are trained. We actually are enforced and encouraged to see it as disconnected topics. So a school level subject becomes the lowest common denominator. You say what, you can say the least about it. So it, if the difference exists between zoology and botany, if there is that much of a disconnect, then I'm sure what kind of a disconnect exists between those three. Robert Hooke, you study about in? Yes. In? Yes. Hooke is the uh, poster picture, poster boy of physics, right? Hooke's law. But Robert Hooke is also 
biology also. Poor guy, he did not have these labels on his head. He was brown, brownian motion? Brown is chemistry, right? Poor man was a botanist in the sense that his vocation was, he was actually looking at the movement of these pollen particles and saying that if this inanimate object, this leaf, this dead leaf, is also motion, what is inanimate, what is non-living? Living things move, right? So what are these small things which are dead, which when observed with a microscopic eye? So I see the world through my sense perceptions, but the moment I bring that piece of technology, a microscopic lens, I see something is oscillating on dead. What is it? Are they microbes? They are not. What is this random zigzag motion about? They have to wait for 50 years till some Jesuits, some priests, who are also interested in, because they are interested in the God question. What all has God embodied with life? So, whether in dharma or in the stone, there is also a knowledge. For them, they are Jesuits. Thinking together then becomes critical in creating a dialogue around concepts. And when I say together, I mean both. You'll be thinking together with your teachers, your peers, an active dialogue around, you know, you have a scientific community which is dialoguing through journals on the subject. Where is the dialogue around what's going on inside classrooms? Where is the dialogue around what seems to be working as a model uh, in, in your specific classrooms? Journal will come when you guys are talking to each other about very, very specific things of what worked, what did not work. Very, very specific things of uh, what are we trying to do? Are we able to achieve that? So that, I think, uh, is one message that I want you to take away from this. So inquiry is not just, as I said, it's not just hands-on, it's minds-on. It's not just about setting up experiments. It's also about letting them create new experiments. It's also about letting go of the fear and also trying experiments that you may conceptualize, which were not there. Trying to create also maybe open-ended experiments or open-ended inquiries. You could also take up open-ended problems, which you don't know answers to. That's a difficult space to negotiate in private school system. It's a difficult space to negotiate in government school system. Uh, but that's therefore I was saying, can you take one project a year that I might want to think about? What are my questions as a teacher that I'm struggling with or I would like to think about? And I demonstrate through my class. I take it through the year with my students. Can I do that? Something which I don't know. Can science classes also be about that? Sciences are about all that we know. But if we see all those pages, flip through it, much of the science was happening without knowing what they're getting at. So you may do the errors, you may uh, falter. Don't feel the need to know the answers. You'll be actually closer to what has been the nature of science, what has been the nature of production of scientific knowledge, you'll be far closer to that. So I hope, uh, you know, I'll take questions from you right now, but that's something which, from my experience as a researcher, I found most, in most contexts, science teachers struggle with, and in most contexts, science ed educators struggle with, that how do you create this unlearning un experience from transmissive approach, this didactic approach that we have been socialized into, that we were, you know, sufferers of into suddenly asking teachers to perform miracles in classroom. Suddenly become people who they never knew you know, was a possibility. So you have a role model, but how do you then become yourselves a role model? That's a big question. And, and that's a task that all of you are capable of taking up on your own. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to me. But anything that you want to share right now, please, you're most welcome. <laughs>